Welcome back, everybody, to Quid Prog Quo, the musical podcast where I introduce my friends and loved ones to progressive rock music, and they in turn get me to listen to whatever they want. And we have a special recurring guest today. Travis is back. Uh, he got me to listen to another band from across the pond. He originally had me listen to Dirt on Grey, the Japanese progressive metal band. And this time we're looking at uh, another really interesting one. These guys kind of focus in a little bit more on the Dream Theater-esque uh, stuff. Uh, and I got him to listen to some Neo Prog. I know that he's not a big fan. So this is my trying to indoctrinate him in the Neo Prog sphere. Um, and so, yeah, it was a good time. Um, and just the usual kind of recognitions. Thank you again to Olena Alinsky for the show's graphic, as well as Explosive Ear Candy for their track All Together Now, which is, of course, the soundtrack to this podcast. And if you are one of those lucky few that are watching this on YouTube, welcome. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video um, and tell your friends about it. And for those of you that are listening to this podcast, wherever you can find your podcast, thank you so much. You guys really do mean the world to me. So without further ado, let's dive into this week's episode. Is this computer? All right. How's it going? It's been a hot minute. Uh, <laughs> stuck at home all the time. There's literally nothing exciting happening here. Yeah. This is this is the highlight of my week. Well, so. you know, that's all right. It's always good to have something to look forward to. And I figured uh, my shelves are really messy, so I'd uh, give you a couple of uh, really nice uh, oh. uh, record covers that I know you like. To, yeah, I uh, actually have at. that that copy of Time in a Word, because most, I guess that's the U.S. printing, because most of the time so. it's that woman that's on it. So Yeah, uh, I got that from a friend of mine uh, a couple months ago. Mm. Yeah, so. it's really good. It's really good. I love the title track. Yeah, it's it, it's a decent record. I, I'm surprised by it. Uh, yeah, it tends to get um, overshadowed by the Goliath that is the Yes album. For I mean, I would I don't want to say for good reason because the Yes album is like a masterpiece, but like, yeah, it does kind of get lost in the fold, kind of like Super Tramp's first two albums. Oh, I really should have trimmed this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You've got like this Grizzly Adam thing going on. It's my uh, pandemic beard. Yeah, this is my pandemic hair. So it's looking pretty glorious. Yeah, I it's, I litter. Yeah, it's getting okay. there. It's getting there. It's getting, it's getting there. there. Yeah, um, you would know this. So um, uh, I took a trip out to Waxman because I picked up an album because I wanted to support him during the the pandemic. So um, I'm about maybe a half hour walk away from from downtown, and nice. so I oh, I bought something ahead of time and I paid him ahead of time. And then while I was there at the curbside to pick up, um, he had a mystery box, which has 20 albums. Okay. That you Perfect. don't know what's what's in it. It's all in a box that's sealed up. Yeah. And it was like $15. And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> I'm going to have to walk home with this. And it's a half hour away. So I got home and it was like a good hour before our recording. And I'm like, ugh. Okay, I have to have a shower because I look ridiculous and gross. So that's why my hair is still pretty wet and everything. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm excited to dive into those. So, I'm I'm excited to see what you got. Yeah, so. I think I'm gonna do the same thing that I did back in the summer when I got one of those boxes and have like an unboxing video with me and my girlfriend. I think it's gonna be pretty fun. So I've uh, I've got a couple friends here in Sudbury that um, also when it's not pandemic time, uh, go out to North Bay and uh, check out Waxman. And uh, they like getting like the, I think it's like the mystery, like the yeah, $5 the mystery, dollar mystery Yeah, packs. the mystery packs. I always, whenever I get anything, so he included one, uh, or at least I bought one when I bought this album online. Um, and it's three to four. Um, and I always pick one up. Uh, and I've, I've never been disappointed. There have been albums that I've either recycled or like, put back into circulation at other record stores but i've never been disappointed there's always been something i'm like huh all right I, i'm tempted to uh go out to north bay one of these uh one of these days and uh yeah check out waxman get mm -hmm. get one of them mystery packs and s just see what's going on huh, maybe we can make like an episode of your show yes. out of it or something like 
I would be and open them up. I would, camera. I would, I would do that for sure. I'd be in for that. Um, That'd be yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's get into today's podcast. Let's get into the actual meat and potatoes of this guy. Uh, you were on here uh, previously, back I believe it was either this. I want to say the summer. I think it was mm-hmm. the summer. Um, I had you listen to six, and you had me listen to Dur on Gray. Yes. That was great. Um, I will admit I haven't actually gone back to re-listen to any of their music, That's okay. but they... I haven't re-listened to six. <laughs> yeah, I mean, six was still like the soundtrack of that summer for me. Um, but uh, yeah, I decided to go a little bit different uh, for this okay. time around. Ooh, yeah. Okay. Um, for this go around, I'm kind of sticking with the same theme that I had before. Okay. Of, okay. Uh, something in your ballpark but maybe that you haven't heard before because it's foreign a little bit Mm -hmm. out of our market right 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 yeah beautiful how we get on with that yeah so you've intrigued me uh lay down on to me what you've what you've got in store for me okay so it's an album by a band from pakistan oh they're called Mizrab. That's oh. M I Z R A A B. Okay, that they are is on Spotify. That, that is a brand new one for me. I have not heard of them. And it's their. And I, I <clears throat> forgive me again because this is going to be another one of those cases of you're going to butcher every single song <laughs> title because okay. it's not in English, but it's their 2004 album. Masi Hal Mutakbil, I think is how it's pronounced. Okay, okay, uh, okay. It, it's all in the Urdu language because that's one of the native languages of Pakistan. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of the lyrics are in that language. Um, I believe the title translates to uh, past, present, and future. Hmm. Okay. And it's uh, very much like in the sort of dream theater prog metal sort of ballpark like uh it's very much uh standard progressive metal but with these sort of uh pakistani influences throughout um especially with the vocal melodies uh i think it'll be a bit of an interesting and sort of different uh kind of uh, experience for you Hmm, it's their only album that's on spotify but they have uh released a couple of other uh uh, they were working on a second album and i guess uh the lead guitar player and vocalist moved from pakistan to england for a while Uh and it just never materialized and then he re-released some of the songs that he had already put out as singles as a solo album later on faraz anwar but uh yeah, it's it's basically the band's only album, and hmm. it, it was just such a weird discovery for me. That's great. How did you discover it? Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's a great source. Uh, yeah. Perfect, perfect. Um, I will tell you of my album choice. Okay. Um, so this is from a genre that I know that you're not too familiar with and have gone on the record to say that you're not a big fan of. So this is my attempt to try to indoctrinate you okay. uh, into the neo prog sphere. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, my glasses are filthy. Um, no worries. And I'm, I'm giving you my favorite uh, band and my introduction outside of Marillion. So I'm not giving you Marillion because yeah. I feel like... I already know... At this point, you probably already tried it and didn't quite connect, which is totally fine. Um, I'm giving you IQ instead. Okay. Uh, It's just IQ. And this was how I fell in love with Neil Prague because I, in my high school life, um, when I was flipping through my dad's records and that was my main way of discovering music, um, I came across his... um, script for Jester's Tear from Marillion. And like, I really liked oh, yes. it. I thought it was really, really good. Uh, but that was the only album from him or from them that he had. He did have um, like Holidays in Eden and um, Change of CD- Seasons on CD and then Real, Real to Real and um, 
uh, the show of the magpie or something like that on tape. Uh, and then he had a warped version of clutching at straws. So you couldn't actually play it because it was warped and the needle would skip all the time. Um, and I enjoyed it. Like I really did like script. It was, it's still my favorite work from them, but I didn't, like it, I didn't fall in love with the Neil Prog. And it wasn't until I got to IQ uh, that I fell in love. And this okay. was what indoctrinated me. Um, they have that same kind of sound, but I feel like there's a little bit more. And I'm not doing this to compare IQ with Marillion. I'm doing this to compare IQ with the rest of the Neo Prog sphere. They're okay. much more um, focused on like guitar riffs and keyboard solos where I feel like the rest of the, even though Neo Prog does have those, I feel with IQ, it's much more prevalent and much more put forward. Okay, um, so a little bit more of an emphasis on the musicianship. Then. Correct, correct, correct. Um, obviously they still hold all the same banners that all Neo Prog does. It's very over the top, very melodramatic, very uh, showmanship and operatic and very theatrical. Um, and this is the album that got me into IQ. This was the first one that I ever listened to. Uh, okay. It is their 2004 release of Dark Matter. Dark uh, Matter. Yes. Okay, there we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually ordered this back in 2006 um, oh, wow. when I was scourging the prog archives. Uh, to try to find any kind of like new semblance of progressive rock because I had already digested everything from the 70s and 80s. Um, yeah. I'm like, I need more, I need more. Uh, so I was looking at like the top 100 albums of the 2000s and this one came up and I'm like, well, it has a 20 minute song as its closing piece, I'm sold. So. Yeah, five tracks from what I can see. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got five tracks, uh, opens up with uh, almost a 12 minute, uh, then it's got three shorter ones, uh, and then the final 24 minute big banger that is the Harvest of Souls. Uh, Definitely and looking forward to the, the 24 minute one. That's, yeah. that's a bold statement to make. And uh, <laughs> it is, uh, I, I will go on the record and say it is probably in my top five favorite plus 20 minute tracks like it's in my top five wow so it is uh, I'll, I'll warn you ahead of time it is a supper's ready clone but <laughs> <laughs> it's still i don't know it tickles my fancy just right there's nothing wrong with a good uh homage mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. one of the greatest prog epics so i mean uh yeah you've got me intrigued uh i will uh make a little bit of a warning about the uh about the uh, Mizrab album is there's something a little odd about the track listing. Hmm, okay. where there's a lot of um, like, if you're looking at it on Spotify right now or whatever, uh, a lot of tracks of like, like outro, intro, yeah. intro and outro. Um, I believe on the original CD, uh, like, are, are you familiar with uh, the idea of like a CD pre gap? Yes. Like Octavarium had a lot of these like little interlude tracks. That would yeah. Have, if you had your old school CD player with the old readout, it would have said like negative one minute and 30 mm -hmm. seconds. Yeah. Um, I know Octavarium did it. I know there's a few um, Muse albums. One that kind of comes out of nowhere that does it a lot is um, uh, Limb Biscuit's Significant Other. Oh, yes. Yeah. Like they had a. Even... Yeah, it, where it would count down the the minutes till the next track, and and there were there was a time like when the CD players could actually like when you put in the first track and hit rewind and hold rewind, it would actually the, like they would put secret songs in there that were like negative two minutes hmm. from the beginning. So that's tricky. That's fun. That's that's a that's a good trick. So Mizrob mm -hmm. did that a lot here, but. Uh, if you look at the track uh, seven and eight in song and in song intro, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. they're both actually the same recording. So if you listen to it all the way through, uh, you're going to hear that twice. I guess that was an error with uh, <laughs> whoever published this to Spotify. So right. just fair warning to anyone who's checking this album out on Spotify. Yes, 
uh, there is a song that plays twice in a row. Now, is that for and all of these? Because uh, it does look like almost every other song has either an intro or an outro and sometimes even both. No, no, that's the only one that has that okay. error. The rest of them are just like little ambient uh, sort of segues in between tracks and, and stuff like that. So yeah, just just that one song in okay. San. Okay, I will. Is... I will keep an ear to that because yeah it looks like this is about uh just under an hour and a half so yeah we like we like them long albums (laughs) that we do beautiful well i will go and listen to these guys uh you i know will have a good time with iq i hope um (laughs) uh and i guess i will send you a new link uh when i get through all of this yeah that sounds great wonderful All right, I will see you back here in about an hour and a half. All right. And with that, Travis and I go into our own music silos to find out what each other's world sounds like. I hope you really enjoy this next part. Um, I dive in pretty deep in Mizrab, I think is how you pronounce it. And Travis gets uh, his first taste of IQ, my personal favorite... um, my personal favorite neo-progressive rock group. And as always, I really want to give a big shout out to some of my patrons. And if you want to be cool like these individuals, head on over to my Patreon. It's Patreon slash Notes Reviews. Uh, And you can be cool like Rick Phillips, uh, who has donated as well as Jeffrey Kusbel. Uh, And those are two of my long-term Patreons. So if you want to be cool like those two individuals, head on over to Patreon slash Notes Reviews. Uh, And if you want to see more of me, you can check out my uh, YouTube page of Notes Reviews. You can also check out notes on tabletop role playing it's a little bit harder to find uh but i upload there uh if you're watching on youtube thank you so much for watching on youtube uh and if you are listening to this i've uploaded the video of this on youtube where you can see this face uh and so that's about it so without further ado let's dive into the episode proper where we find out what travis thought of iq and what i thought of uh ms rap let's dive back in Welcome back. Hello. <laughs> How was that? How did you enjoy some IQ? Oh, okay. So, yeah. There's going to be some interesting uh, chat going on here because... Uh, Good. I mean, I appreciate the purpose with which you went into uh, recommending me this album because, um, like, you touched on it in the first bit neo prog is a genre or subgenre that i'm not particularly enthused by yeah 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 and it's only it's not really like a, a a hate kind of thing like it's just more like anytime i put on neo prog it, it just doesn't nourish me the way other types of prog rock do so mm-hmm you know, it kind of forced me to confront that a little bit and, you know, listen to this album a little bit more deeply and try to quantify mm-hmm. where my thoughts on Neo Prog lay. Right, right, right. So uh, I'm just pulling up my notes here. Yeah, because you said you had notes and I'm, I'm excited... I'm both excited and hesitant to to see those notes. <laughs> Mostly it's just about what I experienced, what I liked, if there was something I didn't really care for in mm-hmm. each track. Uh, I'll say the overall experience with this record. Um, there were a lot of things I really did like about it. And okay. that okay. I really okay. did enjoy, genuinely yeah. enjoyed uh, certain aspects of it. Like... Um, I love the way that the first track, Sacred Sound, builds up Mm -hmm. from Mm -hmm. that sort of dramatic synth opening. And, you know, it kind of takes its time. It doesn't, like, punch you in the face with the riff right away. It it lets you sort of get into it. And, but then that also kind of goes into one of my first criticisms where I felt like the band was riding that organ riff too much like okay 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 by, by about like four or five minutes in i'm just like 
are they going to go to something else now? <laughs> <laughs> and and they do. The second half of the track is a lot more interesting than the first, although um, the, there was one section in that sort of uh, instrumental solo bit that I'm just like, this is the cinema show. Oh, okay. Is, I can, I can see, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is the cinema show just straight up. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, the three songs that follow that are a lot shorter, Red Dust Shadow, You Never Will, Born Brilliant. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you have two heavy hitting epic length tracks on your album, the short ones are always going to kind of feel a little bit more like filler or you, they just don't quite stand up to the rest of the album. Right. And I do feel a bit like that's the case here, although they're, they're good tracks. I mean, if you put these three tracks on any other album of similarly length, similarly you know, compose tracks, they would be perfectly fine. I mean, I really liked uh, the vocalist voice in Red Dust Shadow. Um, yeah. I, I'm not too hot on, I, I didn't look up who the vocalist of IQ is. So that that would be Peter Nichols. Okay, I'm, I'm yeah. not too hot on Peter's vocals. That's fair. And in fact, it took me a while to kind of get used to. Um, some of his mm. earlier stuff does sound like he's he, it sounds like he's singing with like a mouthful of marbles at times. A little bit, yeah. And it, luckily he has waned off of that kind of singing style, but every once in a while it still kind of crops up. Uh, I do love Red Dust Shadow <laughs> and how, uh, this is a staple of Neo Prog, like how melodramatic it is, how emotive it is. And like at that time, for me, that was kind of what I was craving because uh, like, I was still an angst filled young adult, but I never really got on the bandwagon of other angst filled groups of the day, like My Chemical Romance or Panic at Disco or right. Fall Out Boy, like all those like very emotional emo bands I never got into like I got into My Chemical Romance much later on. Yeah. Uh, once I was outside of that, but I I still love like that kind of emo progressive rock theatrical expression. Of course. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I kind of got hints of that throughout the whole record as well. I mean, uh, that sort of melodramatic kind of feel is just mm -hmm. that's what this subgenre of prog is probably best at is it just exudes that <laughs> it does. melodrama and everything is larger than everything else oh, yeah. everything's set at 11 every single thing yeah yeah um and it's interesting one of the main reasons why i gave you this album in particular is the amount of solos that we have on here like on the next two tracks of yeah um, born brilliant and uh you didn't know um I'll, although i'll admit like listening to this album i wasn't really actually all that focused on the solos and the musicianship although mm -hmm. uh, i did note that in you never will um i really really like the drum work in that like mm. there's some really tasty drum fills through that track uh the synth solo is great too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh born brilliant um I actually paid more attention to, and this is weird for me because I never do this. I paid more attention to the lyrics. Oh, interesting. Okay, okay, okay. Because uh, I found them to be a little, um, uh, what's what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, kind of tongue in cheek, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, kind of mm -hmm. cocky, a little okay. bit. Uh, I, I I described it in my notes as. Uh, the lyrics are about the typical prog snob like i'm, <laughs> I'm critical and careless my open mind is shut and mm -hmm. firmly locked mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah you that's know? that kind of that is a very good descriptor of you know certain certain individuals yeah there there are definitely prog snobs i was one of them a oh, long yeah. time ago you know oh yeah uh, it oh, took yeah. me a long time to <laughs> to open my mind yeah yeah i was i was in that same boat uh, I do, I do want to mention a little bit about the drumming because you mentioned that that was a highlight off of um, "You'll Never Know." Um, yeah. Because for for me, 
I always found that that was the weakest avenue of this album was the drumming. I always found like nothing against the drummer who he's the only one that I don't have memorized. Uh, Paul Cook, because okay. um, they did go through quite a number of drummers. Um, I don't know. I always found like, especially on um, You Never Will, I always felt like he was like stretching his ability to its max. And it almost felt like an elastic band that had stretched beyond okay. the amount that it should have. Cause I could, I could hear what he was trying to do. And I felt like the execution wasn't where it really should have been. Like it always felt like he was either dragging or slightly ahead just a little bit. Like it felt, it didn't feel natural. It's um, funny because that's that's almost the exact opposite of which how I felt about I it. I love like, I love that. I love when we get two different opinions about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like when you're actually stretching and like your timing isn't exactly perfect, that's when drumming to me feels more natural because mm. I as a musician mm-hmm, who mm-hmm. works with programmed drums, like I'm so used to lining everything up to the grid and right. everything sounds perfect. Mm-hmm. But it makes it makes the music feel lifeless and dull when everything is like on the grid lined up perfectly. I see what you mean. Yeah. When, when the drummer is a little bit looser and they're just kind of maybe a little rushing or dragging a little bit, Mm -hmm. it does kind of add to a sort of, you know, it reminds us there are human beings playing this Mm. music. It's not all just computerized noise. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really appreciated that in that track. That's a beautiful take. No, I love that. I love that. I always found for me though, it was always the sore thumb um, upon repeated listens. Um, uh, but they have reproduced this track in a live setting where it doesn't quite have that same feel. Uh, maybe he just simply practiced more. <laughs> <laughs> like, or I think it might've been a different drummer, but uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm glad that you, you highlighted that um, because that was always something that I always wanted to talk about. Um, and of course I love the solos on both of those. Yeah. So, I mean, now we're getting into the, uh, giant elephant in the Mm -hmm. room, the, the 24 minute epic harvest of souls. And what did you think? What did you think? I hate to disappoint you, bud. Um, it it was, it was good. Okay. Okay. It was good. I, I, I didn't hate it. There were a lot of elements where it was like it, it felt like it was taking bits and pieces from the rest of the album. Like I think, uh, I think the groove riff from Born Brilliant was introduced somewhere close to the end. Mm-hmm. Um, it it definitely had the same sort of like build as Supper's Ready. Yeah. Um, th- there was one bit where I I kind of just had to giggle a little bit because the lyrics were. Uh, let me open it up on my. Yeah, the lyrics, the lyrics. Are, it got a little uh, are, America kind of yes, and, in there. And I'm like, what does this have to do with anything? Because I'm reading the rest of the lyrics and it it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, because these guys aren't American. They're, they're, no, they're from the UK. They're yeah, they're British. Um, and they always said that it wasn't necessarily a, uh, it wasn't like an anti-American thing. It wasn't like a jab at them. It was just more of a, commenting of kind yeah. of being proud of where you're from and how um like america was the big superpower of the time so yeah. wherever they're kind of looking they're always going to find that like that was britain back in the late 1800s early 1900s right where everything was yeah. was all for britain like do it all for your country um so that's kind of i think putting the face to the concept of the overall track, which I still think is just this big, I wouldn't necessarily say anti-war, but more of just like, this is what happens. Yeah. I mean, after reading the lyrics a little bit, it did it did start to click a little bit more, but it was just one of those things where in the moment, it was a little like, wait, what's going, what's yeah. happening here? <laughs> it's a little strange. It was a little strange. Um, Yeah, so, I mean, I noted a few things about how there's, like, a a war sort of sound effect section in the middle, and I'm like, this is, yes, is Gates of Delirium. Yeah. Um, And I'm going to admit, I actually kind of spaced out about halfway through the track, and it's just one of those tracks where there's so much going on, and I think that that was about when I started to really, like, 
think about okay what is my problem with neo frog <laughs> because and and here's the thing right mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. when when i really break down neo prog into its ingredients yeah everything in it technically i should love it mm-hmm. i should love neo prog it has everything i like you know well written yeah. uh verses and choruses like the songs are good not just the instrumental parts not just the the craziness but like these people can write good effective melodies that are mm-hmm. catchy and get stuck in your head the instrumental musicianship is there you mm-hmm. know these guys know how to play they take creative risks with things like weird time signatures really long songs you know they they have a great sense of when to build up a track emotionally and break it down and yeah by that like all of these ingredients should combine into something that i love but for some reason it's just not holding my attention and i was i i don't know how many car people you have uh i'm sure watching there are. your um yeah i'm sure there's podcasts. a few yeah i'm sure there's a few but it kind of makes me think of the concept of the crossover suv if I'm going to okay. make like some weird car analogy. Okay, okay, okay. Because the crossover SUV is kind of supposed to be like, and, and it is the most popular type of car on the road nowadays. Like you yeah. go out on the road, 90% they're, of what you everywhere. see are going to be crossovers. Yeah. And it's because they're trying to be sort of everything to everyone. They mm. are a station wagon. They're an off-road sports utility vehicle. Right. They are a, a car. They're big and roomy like a van, you know, yeah. they're trying to fit all of these ingredients together to make something like the ultimate vehicle, the ultimate vehicle. <laughs> but what we're left with is a lot of compromises, you know, mm. yes, it's bigger than a sedan, but it's a minivan than an is actual going to van. Yeah. Yeah. I see what yeah. you're saying here. I'm seeing what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, it has, it's lower to the ground and it's, going to handle more like a car but it's still heavy and a little bit higher up and you know it's not going to be as good it's not as utilitarian off-road as a jeep would yeah 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 i'm seeing what you're saying i'm seeing what you're saying yeah 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 and 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 i feel like that's kind of a bit true of neoprog like it tries to be all of these things it it tries to mix all of the elements that i like into something and it, it almost kind of comes off to the point where it does almost feel a little like they're making some compromises in in the effort to put as much into a track as possible. Mm-hmm. You know, the emotions swelling and rising and and sinking again, but then you've got to throw in these technical elements too. And, and then you've got to throw in like the great musicianship and you, you want to have a catchy song. And it, sometimes these elements just don't, mix the way i would hope that they would hmm, which is why okay. like you know i i put up new records as you can see i and, did i did notice that yeah and, and that was on purpose because for me those two bands sort of represent sort of the opposite ideas of what neo prog should be mm-hmm. to me because you know haken of course they are a lot more technical there's a lot more of that dream theater kind of off the wall insanity going on yeah and and, you know they do have very catchy songs too but Mm -hmm. i mean for for haken it's all about like let's make this music as absolutely nuts as possible (laughs) yeah very technical very technical very playful so but the you know their music doesn't quite always have that big emotional rise and fall and sometimes it's really just about can can we experiment with all these different elements and and make something that's just a little kooky yeah yeah yeah. yeah. whereas porcupine tree are the ones that sort of expand on like that emotional element and very true yeah the more songwriting oriented thing they they don't try to be a technical prog rock band in the sense that they're you know constantly throwing you know, seven, eight times solos at you. 
mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. their music is still very progressive it's still like you know they still have these incredibly long songs they still have very adventurous song structures yeah yeah but yeah, it's yeah. done more in the context of singer songwriter kind of oriented music mm-hmm, as opposed mm-hmm. to you know very technical instrumental sort of music right and for me like those two records are kind of if you split neo prog into like the two big elements mm-hmm. that define it you would get those albums I see what you're saying. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's that. There's a little bit, I, I, I try not to be too critical if a band really wears their influences on their sleeves, because Lord knows you listen to any of the music that I write, <laughs> uh, you're going to hear a lot of my influences as well. I'm, I'm as guilty of this as any other musician. Right. But there were there were lots of moments on this album where I, I thought like this is just Steve Hackett playing like right the ending of uh, of that epic uh, I heard Harvest the Souls Harvest the Souls yeah yeah the ending of that that might as well have been Steve Hackett playing for all yeah. I'm concerned uh, and of course uh, I did mention that in Sacred Sound like they just essentially put a section of the cinema show in the middle of it <laughs> yeah. And, and even like that, yes, Gates Delirium bit, like that, th- that was a pretty obvious reference there, I think. And right, right, right. Th- yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with wearing your influences on your sleeve, but uh, I think trying to make the references a little bit less obvious kind of serves a band better in the long run. Okay, okay, okay. I mean, that's the other thing, like, I think of Neo Prog, and it's like, the sound Genesis had in the 70s, if they had put their 80s production on it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And I always I'm not yeah. a, I love 80s music, but I'm not the biggest fan of the production style. Right. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, some of the production work in the 80s was a little strange to say the least. Uh, very, uh, very flat. Yeah, flat like sounding. Yeah. Um like, I don't know too, too much about, like, all the ins and outs in terms of the technicality. I just know, like, what yeah. I'm hearing. But, yeah, it is very, uh, like, I'm trying to think of the right word. Not monotonous, but very, like, uni- unilateral. Like, I guess flat would be a very good word yeah. for it. Like, everything was kind of mixed at the same level. The drums all had the same kind of feel and sound to it. Um, so, yeah, I can kind of see what you're saying in that sense, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm getting a vibe that you weren't necessarily a huge fan of this album. I I, I enjoyed it, but it, it hasn't turned me, it hasn't converted me into okay. a neo prog fanatic. Right. Um, would I listen to it again? Uh, I'd probably give at least um, at least Harvest of Souls and Sacred Sound another listen. Uh, mm-hmm. Harvest of Souls mostly to see if there was anything I missed when I kind of spaced out. Right. Because what, what e- I would... even with long songs that I mm-hmm. like, there's a lot of times where I'll space out. So, right. you know, it's, it, it feels like one of those things I might have to listen to it a couple more times to digest it and really get into it. Yeah. What I would recommend also is checking out the album that um, they put out directly after this one. I mean, okay. directly after it came out like six years three years something like that after this called frequency as well as their mid 90s album of ever Um, okay i think i've actually heard a couple tracks from frequency yeah it was really big um for me it was i don't want to say it was a letdown but um like i loved the title track of frequency and i love um is it riker skies the the, one of the big final tracks off of that album um yeah. And then the remaining tracks are are good. Um it I don't know, it didn't wow me as much as the others did, uh, especially because I was such a huge fan of IQ at that point. I went to like I devoured their back catalog. Um so that like I was pumping up the expectations of this one beyond anything that it could ever reach. Um 
I, I've come to really grow and appreciate Frequency, and I okay. still think it has some of their best music on it. Um, so I would recommend checking that out. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, well, I'm I'm glad that you at least gave it a try, uh, yeah, even if and... it wasn't necessarily your your complete cup of tea. I'll win you over yet. <laughs> and, and hey, you know, it, it did make me think a little bit more about because. I mean, my lack of enthusiasm for the subgenre has never really been out of a, oh, I hate this, mm -hmm. but just, just more of a, I, I haven't exposed myself to enough of it. And the, the little bit of it I have has always been just kind of in one ear out the other. So yeah, yeah, to I actually have the chance to sit and listen critically mm -hmm. to a neo prog record, uh, uh, it helped, you know? Well, that's good. That's good. Uh, so you had me listen to Mizrab. Yeah. Um, and I had a good time with it. I could definitely, oh. definitely hear the dream theater influence on this, uh, okay. especially um, like awake and images and words like that early nineties yeah. stuff. Um, and it was interesting. Was this, was this written in like 2004, 2006? Uh, the album came out in 2004. Okay. And uh, I'm sure that they had the songs. Actually, okay, so they had one album before this called Panchi, mm -hmm. which uh, is the second track on this album. And it was sort of a, it was a very weird record because, um, you know, you got to talk a little bit about the state of heavy metal and rock music in a country like Pakistan for at the sure time, at the time this album came out Misrab were essentially the only heavy metal band in the country and um the album that they put out before this had a lot of the songs that are on here but because they didn't really have access to you know someone who played like a traditional rock drum kit it's right. all like eastern percussion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with like shred guitars over it <laughs> it was a very interesting record so when yeah. they finally came out with this one and it's a little bit more of a traditional rock band kind of setup mm -hmm. um yeah you know it kind of makes a little more sense but there was something very interesting about like the early demos of of these where yeah and the, the whole thing did feel like a very mid 90s metal to me yes um and I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to skip right to the end, but like that final track of Izar yeah. um, was so strange compared to all the other music that came before it. Yeah, it, it does have a bit of a, like almost pop punk kind of I was going to say, it, it felt like a Jimmy Eats World <laughs> track. Like when I was listening to it, I thought for sure this was going to start into like the middle or something like that, um, because it did feel like a pop rock track from that late 90s yeah yeah which was on the like i i enjoyed the song but it gave oh, yeah. me such a strange kind of uh like i thought that this might have been like a bonus track or something that it, was it recorded kind of is later. actually yeah because it just doesn't feel right on this album because and this was something that i did note i love the fact that they were able to balance the hard and heavy tracks with some of those softer and mellower moments that was very akin to like an images and words from dream theater um yeah. and i did note the triple punch that was um going from the soft uh and of course i can't pronounce any of these uh but isan to the heavier af um and then back into kind of a blending of the two with one of my favorite tracks off the album, which was Kitney Said Diane, um, which yeah. I loved. I love the harmonies of this track. I love oh, how yeah. it feels like a marriage between like a, a 70s American prog rock ballad, like from Boston or Kansas or St well, Styx isn't. I don't know if Styx was American or not, but anyway, yes, like they were. Okay, one of those, um, or even yeah, I already said Kansas. Um, but blending that with a more modern Bollywood soundtrack, just with the harmonizations and the vocals, I I drank that up because I love Bollywood, um, <laughs> and I I really found at the end of the day that I enjoyed this, even if 
at times it did feel very much like um I don't want to say a dream theater clone, but it did feel very, very similar to a lot of the dream theater stuff from that early 90s stuff. Mm hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, this is the thing, like, this album is sort of like the birth of heavy metal in the country of Pakistan. And mm -hmm. I mean, you got to understand, like, in, in these isolated pockets of the world where rock music isn't really consumed as much, mm -hmm. um, bands are going to be pulling from maybe a little bit weirder and different influences than we do here in like North America or in Europe where we're just constantly bombarded by it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And so, so, you know, maybe, maybe to them, like the idea of having an album that has like these sort of uh, very Middle Eastern kind of sounding melodies with dream theater instrumentals and, you know, Jimmy Eat World pop rock tunes isn't so weird to them because there really isn't a precedent for that over there. Like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it, to them, it's all just like one good rock and roll mix <laughs> and uh yeah, I mean, when I look at it that way, like these tracks almost kind of like feel a bit like it could just be like someone in the Middle East's like mixtape. Mm -hmm. I could see that. I could totally see that for sure. Yeah. Um, and and I did, I like, I loved most of the tracks on here. There wasn't any one that I was like, Ugh, make it stop now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think my only i and it's not even a criticism it's more of an observation it's just that that last track kind of ruins the the flow of the overall album for me a little bit yeah um yeah i was saying that 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 track is hard um kind of is a bonus track because mm. um from what i've read in forums like I, I was a member of the band's forum back in the day and oh uh, okay uh followed a couple of uh members of the band on various social media platforms mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but uh they they would talk about like the influences behind some of these songs and ishar was actually written to be sort of like a a tv like theme song for uh mm. pakistan's uh football league I could see that. I could 100% see that. Yeah, it's got that yeah. get up and go kind of very accessible drive to it. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 so it was meant to be sort of like part of a soundtrack for uh, for sporting events. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So yeah, uh, they did a couple of uh, tracks like that over the years too. Like um, they did uh, a cover of a sort of a patriotic folk song from the country, Dil Dil Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, they they did it in kind of the same style. Okay, yeah. As that, and yeah. Uh, interesting thing about the band too, um, the, the front man, basically the main guy in the band, uh, Faraz Anwar, he's a guitar player mm -hmm. and uh, vocalist. Um, he was actually discovered by Alan Holdsworth, of all people. Okay. Okay. And... Um, I believe Alan Holdsworth had something to do with uh, getting this album sort of out there and disseminated among people. And uh, he also helped, uh, like he signed Faraz to his record label and uh, helped him work on his first solo album, which came out around the same time as this. So, yeah. A lot of people would listen to this and say, oh, well, I hear a lot of John Petrucci and Dream Theater, but there's also a little bit of that jazz fusion Alan Holdsworth thing going on. Yeah, because I wasn't, it, it was very interesting. At no point did I ever really hear a John Petrucci guitar work. Like, I, I always heard them. I, I think it was more on the atmosphere that they were bringing. Yeah, like the actual songwriting. Yeah. It's very normal traditional progressive metal dream theater-ish kind of atmosphere and then mm -hmm. you have like this very unique kind of guitar work over it and uh that was what drew me to the band in the first place was oh, okay. like just hearing that really excellent guitar work and uh yeah i'm glad that you dug it yeah yeah, I don't know if I would return to it on the regular, but I, it was definitely one that I enjoyed my entire time with. And if I was looking for something outside of just my regular dream theater 
crave, uh, I would very easily go to this or even recommend it for somebody that's like, I'm looking for something that's like dream theater like, but isn't, uh, this would be a go-to for me. Yeah. And for me, it was part of a phase of just kind of looking for prog rock and prog metal from just parts of the world that you wouldn't expect it to be mm-hmm. like, like who expects a prog metal band from Pakistan? Yeah, yeah. The only one that I can think of is one of my favorite acts of Efrat, but I believe they're Israeli. Uh, um, yeah, <laughs> that doesn't mix well with Pakistan. <laughs> not quite. I'm not, we're not getting into politics no, on this one. No, <laughs> no, but, but I mean, it's same, same area of the world. Um, and it was just, it's a beautiful record called uh, No One's Words. That oh, was... Yeah. That was Daniel mixed. Gildenlow's on that. He is. He is, he is. indeed on one of my all time <laughs> favorite tracks. Um, but like that was the only other flavor that was kind of a little bit similar. But I did feel like no one's words was more of like a pain <laughs> of salvation. Whereas this one yeah. feels a little bit more like a, a dream theater. Yeah. Um, I, I had a few other albums floating around in my head for you for this because I really wanted to go with that theme of like metal from places you wouldn't expect it to be mm-hmm, uh mm-hmm. one of the other bands was a band called art cell from bangladesh oh um, they're pretty good too and it's a very similar style okay. maybe a little bit more on the metal side um a band called mother jane from india hmm. okay 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 also very sort of dream theater yeah yeah dream yep. theater-esque uh and you may have heard this band many times before but orphan land from israel oh i don't know if i know orphan land Ooh. Yeah, that'll be that'll i will i will hold off so that somebody maybe could introduce me in the future to that uh if you if you dig opeth and um yeah yeah excellent it's uh it's good stuff it's good stuff <laughs> <laughs> well thank you once again for coming on and uh you know problem. enjoying some worldly music uh and being a good sport while i'm trying to indoctrinate you in different musical expressions <laughs> um, it definitely gave me food for thought we'll put it that way that is true that is true uh is there anything you want to promote uh anything you want to have the listeners and watchers uh know about no I I I haven't been very active on YouTube lately. Um, unfortunately, uh, having some computer issues, we'll put it that way. That's fair. Yeah, I think we're we've all been there. Um, but thank and you. Also, oh, yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> go for it. I was just going to sign off, but go for it. Also, just issues with not a lot of really interesting music coming out lately for me to review. Ooh. I mean, with the pandemic and everything, I'm not really catching a lot of new music that tickles my fancy and i'm doing a lot of reviews for ultimate guitar um yeah yeah. my review of the latest offspring album just went up there it was Mm -hmm. a pretty bad album (laughs) yeah well yeah (laughs) so i mean that's kind of where my focus is right now is with the ultimate guitar reviews Mm -hmm. uh i did get a review up for the new liquid tension experiment i saw that and it looks like uh, um i won't i won't take the wind from your sail so i'll let you say it Mike Portnoy responded to it and that was pretty awesome. Uh, was very happy with my review. So yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Um, so if you want to check out my reviews, uh, I do pretty much all of the album reviews on ultimate guitar.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's definitely not all prog. There's going to be a lot of uh, metal, hard rock, even pop music from time to time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not going to give too much of a sp- spoiler on what i'm working on next but uh Mm -hmm. the next review i'm writing is for probably the most well-known death metal band on earth so i'm kind of looking forward to uh giving that a shot Mm -hmm. no that sounds great yeah uh and so everybody check those out um i'll if you're watching this on youtube i'll leave the link down below in the description to check out the ultimate guitar uh reviews Um, and I just want to thank everybody for checking us out, watching and listening. Um, stay safe, everybody, and, uh, just keep sharing music. Take care.